All right. Hey, guys, welcome to today's episode of Return on Podcast with me, Tyler Jeffcoat. Uh, guys, I'm excited. I, get to, I actually get to interview one of my top competitors in the e-commerce accounting space today. You're going to know him. Nathan Hirsch uh, was the founder, CEO of FreeUp. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's the outsourcing company where they helped you hire VAs. Um, Nathan and his business partner sold that business once it reached 12 million in revenue a few years ago. And now they've started like three or four other businesses. One of them, I obviously is a competitive seller accountant, but I just really respect Nathan. I love his entrepreneurial mindset. I love the way he approaches using systems and people to build scalable things. And I think his mindset as a guy who went from Amazon seller to free up founder to multi-pronged entrepreneur uh, is something you're going to find really fascinating. And so I hope you enjoy this episode and this interview with my friend Nathan Hirsch on Return on Podcast. It's time to maximize profitability and cash flow. It's time to learn habits and hacks from the best e-com CEOs. It's time for Return on Podcast with me, Tyler Jeffcoat. All right. I'm going to bring in my friend, Nathan Hirsch. Nathan, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks for, for having me. I know I rescheduled once, but it's good to, good to be here. You know what? It's, uh, it's good to be in a recording rhythm where that doesn't, doesn't even matter. Before we hit record here, I was laughing. Nathan, I apologize for having to reschedule. I didn't even remember. That's just what it looks like to like own multiple interests and kind of figure out your schedule because your assistant tells you when you're supposed to be there and where to be. And um, so no worries, dude, completely get it. Well, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Nathan, um, you're gonna get to know him. I mean, this guy's a monster in, in the e-commerce space and the entrepreneur space and, uh, free up was a massive success. Uh, your, your bookkeeping firm, Ecom balance is a massive success. Um, before we dive into some of the technical stuff, uh, related to that, um, what have you learned, man? I mean, you're, you're one of these guys that's, um, built, sold, built, 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 you know, we can add a couple of commas there. Like, what do you think you've learned as an entrepreneur over the last several years? Yeah, for, for me, it's about finding big markets that already exist. I, I I don't know. I'm not, I'm an entrepreneur, but I've never been one to come up with a lot of unique ideas. Like I've never come up with a new product or something revolutionary, the next Uber or whatever it is. Um, but I like finding just big markets that just apply to all businesses and they're just taking my small percentage of the market with some kind of spin on it, usually around customer service and, and great processes and efficiency. And that's good enough for me. And you can build a pretty big company doing that. So if you think of my companies, I got into Amazon really early 2008, 2009. I didn't reinvent the wheel there. I was selling baby products and toys. Everyone has babies. They need to buy baby products. I just had a kid four months ago and I'm buying all the same stuff that I was selling 10 years ago. So again, just big market, high margins, stuff that everyone needs. It's not going everywhere, anywhere with free up. Every B2B business needs to hire whether they want to or not. So we could compete with Upwork and Fiverr because there's just such a gigantic market for people that need VAs and freelancers. And our 12 million that we did in, in revenue our fourth year is nothing compared to the publicly traded Fivers of the world, but it's still a pretty solid business. Bookkeeping, I mean, you and I are our competitors, so to speak, although sure. I'll say you're one of the, the nicest guys I've ever met. I mean, you were super helpful when we, had, when we got started and I asked you a bunch of questions and you were really nice to me and answered them, but everyone needs bookkeeping, whether they like it or not, whether they're an e-commerce seller or not. So there's no shortage of clients and even the SEO space, my newest venture, uh, Trio SEO, if you want to grow your, your B2B business and you want your own website, you got to focus on SEO. If you're ignoring that, you're making mistakes. So I like to just find big markets and take my small percentage of it. And, and I think some people do it the reverse way, which is fine, but I, I'm kind of good with my boring businesses that, that apply to everyone. Yeah, I, I love that. I think um, that's, that's kind of my my. Uh, impression of you, Nathan, is that you really have the superpower. You and Connor, you guys are kind of like two peas in a pod. But you get your ability to to take those markets that exist. By the way, I'm like you. Like my brother has a new cool creative idea every other week for a business. I'm not. Like I mean, my dad's an engineer. I'm an accountant. Like I built a home healthcare company because I saw an Alzheimer's need. I, I sold it in 2017. You know, because it was time to get out of that market and bookkeeping has kind of been similar and CFO has been similar for me in that regard. So I think I, I identify a lot with you, but I view your superpower as being, how do you connect 
the right, I, I guess it's like people and processes, essence, like you said, customer support and success. I mean, is there anything else or anything that you feel like was a, was a key for free up in particular? Is that the one everyone's heard of going from, okay, 1 million to 12 million in annual sales? Like that's, that's a pretty strong scaling story. Like what was the secret to your success? Yeah. So we have this organic marketing blueprint and you can actually grab it if you go to outsourceschool.com slash organic marketing. And it's the same thing we do in all of our businesses. We're really just running the same playbook over and over. Uh, it starts with SEO as the backbone. Whenever we start a company, we, we start the blog and we know that it's not going to help us for six months, but we build it early and we're pumping out high quality keyword relevant blog articles from the beginning. We, we look for, for partners for free up. We, we started off providing e-commerce VA. So we went to every single e-commerce software company out there. We said, you don't provide VAs. We don't provide Amazon software. We both have lists of e-commerce sellers. Let's cross promote each other. Let's get backlinks. Let's do newsletter blasts. So we build up these partner directories. And if you go to ecombalance.com slash partners, you can see an example where we just try to work with everyone in the space that isn't a direct competitor and, and just do cross promotions that are mutually beneficial. And that's a great way to get in front of thousands of people. We, we go on podcasts. That's the third thing. I'm on this podcast now. It's good for backlinks. It's good for SEO. It's good for networking. It's good for uh, meeting the top people in your space. Uh, four is influencers. We, if someone has a, a Facebook group of e-commerce sellers or um, maybe they, they have a, a big email list, there, there's all different types of, of influencers. And all these kind of go together, right? Like podcast helps SEO. Podcast host could also be an influencer. You could go on a podcast and they could become a partner. And there's a few other things as well, but it's really the same blueprint we run on, on all of our businesses. And now we're in the, the position where we have a following. We've got our, our personal brands, our social media partners that we've worked with in different businesses. And we, we kind of have all these different services that apply to a lot of sellers. So it's easy to kind of cross use a podcast that I'll mention different things or an influencer that might want to refer outsource school and econ balance. So that's yeah. kind of our marketing blueprint for, for anything that, that we start. Yeah, it makes sense. It really makes sense. And it's a, I feel like um, that superpower of the the process, the focus on you know, the marketing, you just kind of articulated a really well put together marketing process, right? The ability of generating uh, any business. Uh, I just finished Alex Hermosi's more recent book, $100 million leads, right? This idea of, can I create a sustainable uh, irresistible offer with a marketing funnel that is scalable. And, uh, yeah, man, you're great at that dude. So, okay. So you sold your business. Uh, you and I both sold larger agencies. Yours was much larger than mine in terms of top line revenue. Mine was seven figures. Yours was eight figures, but how has selling your business changed, changed your life, Nathan? Is it same yeah, guy, I'll give right? you a, a quick correction first. So FreeUp was a, a marketplace, not an agency. The difference I'm being sorry. we didn't I'm actually sorry. manage all the people on there. Um, but it, I think that's one thing that that we like, like scalable businesses and that, yeah. that made it scalable. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it changed my life a lot. I mean, before I had my, my son now, my wife and I became foster parents. We're, we're taking a little break now, uh, but we'll go back to it. But we were able to foster teens and help them out. And I was super fortunate that my parents were – weren't rich, but they were loving and they put food on the table and we were middle class. And I had a, a childhood where they taught me finances and how to save money and, and a lot of stuff that people just don't, kids don't get in the foster system. So we were able to give back. Um, we were able to buy our, our second house in Colorado and rent out our house in Florida. Um, I mean, I just stress wise, I'm able to start businesses and not really care if they fail. I mean, obviously I want them to succeed and I do everything possible for them to succeed. But if something doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. It's not like I'm going to have to go out and get a nine to five. And I don't know if I'm just never going to have to get a job or I don't know if I'm, I could just never work again. Depends on what I do with, with money for the rest of my life. But if I just wanted to take the next five years off, I, I could, or 20 years off, I could. So I'm kind of in that position where I'm doing stuff because I want to, and I don't do anything unless I absolutely want to do it. Yeah. And before that, I was starting businesses with five grand, 10 grand. Now I, I want to put a little bit more money just to kind of accelerate the process uh, a little bit, which is a choice. And we don't do that with all businesses, but we have the option to, to do it. So it's definitely given me more just flexibility, life freedom. Um, there's also funny things like outside of podcasts, I refuse to do Zoom calls. Um, I'm retired from conferences. Uh, you'll right. never see me at another conference again. I don't want to run any business that requires to me to go anywhere or do anything. Uh, so there's certain things like that where I just kind of tweak my routine to only do things that, that I want to do. Yeah, it makes sense. This is actually like dovetailing to that point there. Um, 
this is what we try to tell our clients. I'm sure you guys tell yours also like your mindset, like is one of the questions you and I get often is like, when should I sell my business? Right. I'm a whatever $1.5 million Amazon seller or Shopify brand owner. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out when to exit. And so much of the, when you should get out depends on how much of your net worth this asset is like, so for you, Nate, it sounds like, and for me, for sure, when I was uh, running my first company, man, that company was like the entire ball of wax. Like our entire livelihood was tied up our entire net worth. Except for what if we, we what do we have like twenty k in equity in our house like everything else was tied up in the yeah. company that that we owned, and so selling it was like was actually a great idea because it de-risked our lives substantially. And now with our 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 subsequent businesses that we're running, um, we get to be what you just described, and I hope you guys can feel this way also. We get to be more a what we want to do instead of what we got to do, and then b we get to be a little bit slower and pick our markets better when we want to exit. Uh, because we're not trying to de-risk our balance sheet. I mean, is that kind of the way you view your exit mindset now versus what it might have been five or six years ago? Yeah, it's a that's a great way to put it. I mean, it, it just gives you so much flexibility to do what you want. And you, you have to understand business is hard. Businesses fail. Good businesses fail. Anything can happen. COVID or, or whatever could wreak havoc on any, anything you're doing. So if you're turning down that offer or you're not selling at the right time, um, th that can really hurt you down the line. And, and I almost relate it to the, the professional athlete who gets that big contract extension offer. And you can turn it down, but you have to know the risks that come with it. You could go in tomorrow and break your ankle and never get that opportunity again. If anyone's seen the, the, the that show about the, the Pepsi lawsuit where the guy, the guy was offered a million, two million bucks, and he turned it down to sue Pepsi and lost and got nothing, like – that happens and it happens more more often than not. So if your business is doing well and you're early on and, and you have, like you said, have all your eggs in one basket, selling might not be the worst idea, assuming you have good buyers that are ethical and that there's a good offer on the table. And it, it, there's so many other opportunities for you that, that you can um, that you'll get a, a head start on in the future. Yeah. And we had a couple of clients kind of to your point there, like literally in the Amazon space that got they got the number they were thinking they wanted for their business, but the FOMO, well, I haven't shopped every aggregator out there, Nathan. I, I don't, I don't know exactly what all the offers are and thinking of a couple of instances in particular where they said, no, they turned it down. They were like, no, I'm going to hold out. Clearly I got that offer too quickly. I'm not going to sign it. And then lo and behold, middle of 2021, the market gets a little bit worse than it had been prior. And, uh, oh man, the guy ends up taking a deal for, you know, 75% of what he had been offered the first time. And so again, I, I think what's so wise about what you said there, Nathan, is if if this asset that I'm managing is like 10% of my net worth, eh, I'm playing with house money. I'm going to make this max. I'm going I'm to be more of an optimizer of the value of the asset. But if that asset is like 80% of my net worth, like <laughs> it's like it's almost like when Eric Reese talks about like leap of faith assumptions in the lean startup, like, like if this is the thing that if it fails, my family fails, then I, I just need to know my number and have the guts to pull the trigger when the number arrives. So I don't get stuck with a bag if the market changes. Yeah. And there's an age factor too. I mean, when I was running my Amazon business or free app, I was in my twenties. I didn't have a family. I was hustling. I could take risks. I didn't really have any responsibilities and I'm not trying to take gigantic risks. I don't want half a million dollars or a million dollars in, in one thing that could stop it at any moment, if that's all of my, my net worth, like you said. So you, you kind of change too, as you get older and, and you're, you, and what you care about risk matters too. And I've always been a very risk adverse person, even though I'm an entrepreneur, just like I don't come up with crazy ideas. I don't think I take crazy risks, not, not to say that things can't fail, but if things do fail, I'm not going to end up on the street. I'm not going to, I don't really believe in debt. Like I'm, I'm not going to owe someone a, a ton of money. So th that's kind of how I approach entrepreneurship. Yeah. That's so good, man. So, uh, so let's talk about the mood right now. So, Hey, as we're recording this right at the beginning of 2024 episode will probably go live here in a couple of weeks. And the mood has shifted from amazing two years ago to Oh crud a year ago to like maybe somewhere in between now. And I'm just curious, like, what are you seeing either in, um, in all the businesses that you run and, and especially amongst the e-commerce brand owners and Amazon sellers, like what's the mood right now? What's the, what's the outlook in the market right now from your perspective? So I made a post about this, I, I think yesterday, and this is, I truly believe this. And I've read this in a bunch of books too. I try to avoid the noise of the market at, 
at all times. Not that I'm not informed. There's a difference between being informed, but I'm not trying to predict the next recession. I'm not trying to predict whether AI is going to take over the world. You you kind of make decisions that are correct for your particular business. And, and every business is different. And sure, AI could take over the world and our bookkeeping businesses could go down, but I'm not going to wake up every day paranoid about some big recession or something that, that may or may not happen. And if you go to any year in the past 100 years, there's someone, multiple high influential people saying, hey, recession's coming, sell everything, whatever it is. So I really uh, avoid the noise and, and try to just make educated decisions on a, a short term basis while, while also factoring in what something's going to look like um, down the line. And, and that's really how I approach it. And things are things are almost never as bad as they seem and things are always never as good as they seem. So that's why when when all the aggregators were, were kind of going crazy in my mind, I was like, this seems too good to be true. Usually when th something seems too good to be true, it is. And that ended up happening. But even on the, the low where people are going out of business, sure, there, there's fatty businesses that um, never really had a chance. But for the most part, things even out, things go up and down, things go back and forth. And very rarely do you just hit that crash where lots of different businesses fail. Certain, certain ones can, but things correct themselves relatively quickly. It's like maybe to that point, because I love that mindset, the idea that it's not... Uh, we have to be aware of what's going on around us um, and we want to make good choices, but living, living paranoid about things you can't control isn't very helpful. I, I completely resonate with that. Here's my question though. You and I, uh, I think I'm a couple years older than you. I, I just turned 40. I actually don't know how old you are or anything, but like 34. you and I are of the same. What would you say? Yeah. 34. There we go. Okay. So um, you and I have never been CEOs in a market that wasn't the kind of like 2010 to current like kind of bull market here's my question has anything about the way you lead your operations had to tighten down or pivot as the market has gotten a little bit softer yeah it's a good question uh the to fir uh, first a big change and maybe i should have said this before is i don't want to be the ceo i want to be a founder and i want to put an operator in every single business before i thought it was cool being a ceo to me being a founder is, is way cooler so that's kind of a, a mindset shift there to me, the way that I operate businesses are are just very lean. They don't. It doesn't cost a lot to run any business, even going back to free up, even going back to the the Amazon business. So that I, I'm always I always want to do stuff like have an emergency fund. I always want to be uh, aware of costs. I always want to measure stuff like like client turnover and and know how close we are to to having to have to do anything drastic uh, with the Amazon business. We we sold 25 million over seven years. I made a lot of cash. I never built anything that was sustainable. It was just great because it was good timing getting into Amazon. But at the end of all that, we had to lay everyone off, and that was terrible. And that left the worst feeling in my mouth, having to tell the, all these people that really loved uh, the company that they were going to have to get another job. So since that day, and I think that's probably even a little, one of many reasons we sold free up is I didn't want to not sell it and then have something happen and have to do the exact same thing again. But to this day, I'm very aware of that. Obviously you have to fire people in business and stuff happens, right. but I want to do everything possible to not let that happen. And, and I try to build my businesses in, in a way where it's not just one thing that's going to break everything. And even going into marketing, I mentioned the different things. Um, if SEO stops working, if my content on social media, let's say my Facebook account gets blocked, whatever it is, sure, that would hurt the business and not be very good. But I'm getting clients in other ways where that wouldn't happen. And then diversifying, just having different businesses protects you against that. If one goes down, you have other ones. Um, types of services you offer, people on your team. For me, it's just about diversifying as much as possible, having that mentality that you're the founder, not the CEO, and putting good people in that are smarter than you that can overcome um, anything that, that will come up because businesses is just a, a lot of ups and downs. Yeah. So just to circle to that a little bit, because I'm not as aware of the Amazon story. Um, like, do you mind me asking, like, what, 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 a, what went wrong with the Amazon business, and and maybe as a pivot, that what, what advice would you give some of the sellers out there right now? They they have that same mindset, like, man, I, I, I give a shit, I care about these people that are working with me. Like, was it like to kind of steward and shepherd the the assets that we're in charge of in a way that you know allows us to honor the people that work with us? I mean, give, give us a little bit of that story if you don't mind. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in my mind, I came up with drop shipping. I'm sure that's not true, but I had like, I, this was 2008, 2009. I didn't even know what the word drop shipping was. I didn't figure out that word till years later. So I was buying and selling textbooks and competing with my school bookstore and selling them on Amazon, which is mostly a bookstore. I started mm -hmm. noticing that Amazon had all these other products starting to pop up, a lot of baby products, toys, stuff like that. And I got a cease and desist letter from my college telling me to uh, knock it off and, and stop competing with them. And I didn't want to get kicked out of school. I also didn't have anywhere to store inventory. I didn't have money to buy inventory. So I went to this website, slickdeals.com, and I started drop shipping from there to Amazon sell or to Amazon buyers. And then I started going around slick deals to the manufacturers. And at the time they didn't know e-commerce. So my pitch to them was, Hey, I got a new sales channel for you. All you got to do is keep my credit card on file, ship stuff where I tell you to, I'll mark it up. You can even charge me retail prices down the line. I learned that I could get cheaper than retail prices. And that was my business and no one else was really doing it. I had to be one of the first thousand Amazon sellers selling anything outside of books on, on Amazon. Um, one of the first drop shippers, if not the first, then, then somewhere up there. And yeah, I mean, the, the business was great. The downside is I wasn't selling my own product. So I was very dependent on all these other manufacturers who eventually realized that they didn't really need me. They could just sell their own products on Amazon. Took them seven years to, to figure that out. Um, and then the other side of it is Amazon just got harder. They started to look look down on drop shipping and realize what was going on there and not want to do it. So it was a, a great um, it, it was great timing. It was a great experience. I learned a lot. Um, it, it also like Amazon's algorithm changed when, when I first started. There wasn't wasn't a lot of Amazon software. There wasn't a lot of competition by year seven. Everyone was learning how to sell on Amazon. So it, sure, if I could do it over again, maybe I launched my own private label or I pivot a little bit earlier or whatever. But the, essentially, I it built that business using VAs. And when everyone started selling on Amazon, I started offering the VAs to people, which became free up and, and pivoted from Amazon to, to free up. But along the process, all our, our US team, we let go with the Amazon business because Amazon just got too hard and and it wasn't wasn't like it was in year one, two, three, and four, you know? Yeah, it totally makes sense. That's a, what a, yeah, what a great story. And that's one that a lot of people would, would resonate with. So, okay. So like get to a, um, a little bit of a, like how you manage your life question here as we kind of close this episode, like, listen, Nathan, you're, you're running a lot of stuff. You know, I got a kid, you got a four month old, like that's, that's a thing. Like that's there, there we go. What is it that really helps you manage your energy or what's the, what's the life hack that you feel like gives you maximum ROI? I, I love waking up early and just getting stuff done before people are on, before people bother me, even with a kid. Like when my kid gets up now at four or 5 a.m., I'm putting him back to sleep and I'm starting my day and just tackling whatever that that highest priority thing. Every day I get whatever the most important thing is done that day, first thing in the morning. So even if I don't do anything else that day, it's a win. And then my other hack is my workout time. I do intense one hour workouts once a day. I'm going to do it right after this, usually uh, late morning, early afternoon. That's my brainstorming time. No one's texting me. No one's calling me. I'm not on my computer. I'm not looking at a screen and I can just think. And a lot of times people don't get away from their business uh, to be able to actually think and problem solve and come up with new ideas. But they're just so stuck in the weeds. And for me, when I remove myself from that, that's when the best ideas come up. I love it. So actually, this is something that came up in a discussion last week, Nathan. So workout. Are you a um, no audible guy, podcast guy? You're a no noise guy. So you can like process like what's your what's your current take there? <laughs> so my new thing over the past two years is audiobooks, uh, fiction audiobooks, usually like thrillers or mysteries. I'm a sucker for a good twist. And that just gets me completely away from from business and focus and enjoying a good story it makes the workout go by faster too. And for that, that's changed. Like there was a while I was doing Tim Ferriss every day uh, for yeah. for a year. But right now that that's what I'm into. Love it. It was, I was, I was, I was challenged by some of my, actually some of my teammates last week and a couple of guys in a mastermind I lead where I, um, sometimes can do things that are super entertaining, love them. Sometimes I'll get on a real kick and, you know, listen to a thousand books on audible, but I'm trying to do a better job now. Like if I go on a run, I'll give myself permission to listen to whatever the heck I want to listen to on the way back. But when I'm running out, I'm, I'm creating silence where I can actually force my brain to wander and just think about whatever the hell it wants to think about. Right. And just process and uh, try to solve problems because if not, I'll, I'm really bad about filling um, every second of my life with noise of some sort. 
And anyway, this is pretty recent. I'm like, I struggle with that too. I, I'm terrible with silence. I'm bad at meditation. Wish I was yeah. better. It's probably something I could work on, but I struggle with yeah. it for sure. There we go. So you see, guys, the the hack to the hack this week in this episode is do better than we're doing, right? So but that's <laughs> there it is. <laughs> hey, Nathan, this has been great. I really um, appreciate you joining Return on Podcast, guys. Uh, Nathan's got some monster businesses. Again, Ecom Balance is, is another bookkeeping firm. Those guys do a great job. Um, tell so I'm going to put the links to all of your stuff when we put the show notes together. Um, but give us the 30 seconds that people need to get a hold of your businesses where where they should head. Yeah. First of all, Nathan Hirsch or Nathan Hirsch 99 on any social media channel, whether it's LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, if you want our unique hiring process that we use in all our businesses, you can grab that at Outdoor School. We've got two bookkeeping businesses, Ecom Balance for e-commerce sellers, accounts balances for uh, accounts balances for other online businesses. And we have an SEO blog writing service, trioseo.com if you want to check that out. Love it. Love it. Love it. Nathan, thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate you joining Return on Podcast today. Yeah, I can. Thank you. All right, guys, have a great day. Thank you, listeners, for joining Return on Podcast here with me and Nathan. Listen, guys, your time is valuable. Hope you can grab something here that generates value for you and your business. But until next week, um, cheers. Talk to you then.